My name is Andrew Lee. I'm the co-founder of uh, Sugar Bowl Bakery based out of San Francisco. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of Thank you for coming on today. Um, I have seen your products at all the big box stores for many years and uh, never put it all together until a friend of mine told me about you and your story and your family story. So you come from a family of five brothers. Uh, and before you all got working in the bakery, what what did you guys all do? Well, uh, Ken, we uh, <clears throat> um, were born in Vietnam in a very small town. It's very, it's literally, it's a village. Um, during the day, th- 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 you see, you saw the uh, army came marching, um, <clears throat> marching in front of our house. And five minutes, they were two. The recon came out, right? So uh, you know, the uh, fighting was uh, horrible there. Uh, so back in 1978, we, um, like in, any other uh, both people, uh, we uh, uh, left Vietnam. We came to the United States. Uh, so um, fi- uh, five of us uh, and my, uh, one of my sisters um, and uh, my parents uh, came to uh, the Bay Area. Uh, we didn't come to, uh, together. But we came here. We was uh, very poor. We didn't have any money. Uh, actually, I was. We were rocked twice uh, on the ocean. Uh, so we came here. We didn't have any any money. We did not have uh, high educations. We did not have uh, 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 the ability to speak uh, English. So uh, the uh, most um, the, the the best job um, uh, we had at the time was a dishwasher, or janitorials, or newspaper carrier. And one of my brothers uh, actually uh, baked, uh, you know, you know Chinese donuts. Right? Yep. So he fried Chinese Chinese donut at home, and delivered to um, uh, some Asian uh, sub, uh, Asian market in the in the San Francisco uh, Bay uh, Bay Area here. And so, um, so that uh, that was uh, that was what we do um, uh, at the time we came. And uh, my sister in laws at the time, I had three sister in laws. Um, they. Uh, uh, they were seamstresses, so they um, and uh, and uh, in the evening they uh, bought uh, piece piecemeal work uh, home. So all you know, all of us, the family, you know, helped them out, and and uh, we did what we could to uh, save the money uh, to um, eventually buy a sugar bowl bakery. And so you had one brother making, I, I assume, your chow way. Is that what you? Chow way, yeah, yeah. Who's exactly. making your chow way? Uh, yeah. And he was just Bamoy. He was just sending it out to different uh, restaurants. Yeah, Bamoy uh, to uh, different um, restaurants or or the market uh, in uh, in San Francisco. And and do you think that that's really sort of the reason, the origin story of how you got into the baking business? That was uh, part of it. Uh, uh, the um, the baking business uh, came actually uh, by accident. Uh, there was a um, small shop uh, on Babo Street uh, near a uh, family friend's uh, shop, and uh, they, they didn't do well. The husband and wife uh, didn't do well. Uh, actually, that shop was there for many, many decades. Uh, at the time uh, they took over, they didn't do well. So uh, they uh, put that on the market, and the fan the family fan came to us, say, hey, you know what, uh, maybe you, your, uh, you brothers could, you know, uh, buy that one and uh, work in the, fa- uh, work, uh, you know, uh, get the family to members together to work there, uh, selling coffee and making a pastry. Was, at, at that time, you know, there, there was not much for us to do. So we, um, we jumped onto the opportunity to buy it. So it was only $300 sales a day. Right? So uh, one of my brothers uh, who uh, made your choice, uh, said, uh, yeah, you know what? Um, uh, the worst is uh, I bring my George away there to make it, and then we uh, deliver to, uh, uh, you know, to all these uh, stores, and uh, maybe we can, could expand it, and that's how we did. And why would five brothers agree to all jump in to the business? It's a tiny bake shop. Why would five guys jump in and do this? You know, uh, uh, Ken, we are Vietnamese, right? So we, uh, you know, a sense of families. 
uh, we want to take care of each other. We want to get together. Um, and the family value is uh, uh, we want to start together because we came here very poor and there's no no any other way to make a, you know make a decent living at the time. So that was the starting point. Okay? So so that's how we uh, started. And and if you ask me why, that is uh, our family value. So and, and nobody yeah. decided to go to school or get a college education. Like typically, you know, uh, people in those days did their best to maybe send. If there's five boys, you know, four boys would go to school. One boy would work and just try to penetrate the education money, give it to all the brothers. But I, I find it to be a very interesting uh, story, you know, to, to hear that five brothers went in at the same time. Yeah, you know, uh, Ken, you, uh, you, um, you got it right. Uh, um, I actually, uh, at that time, we came here as an adult. We, mm -hmm. we didn't come here as, you know, like uh, to high school yeah. or elementary school. We came here as an adult. And you're right. I, uh, I, uh, at that time, I, um, I decided to go to school. I went to ESL school for one year. I went to San, uh, City College of San Francisco for three years. I actually got a um, uh, computer information system degree from City College of San Francisco. And a friend of mine uh, actually convinced me to go to um, uh, San Francisco State University to get a financial uh, accounting degree. And I, at that time, I was the one who decided to go to school and go and get a job because we didn't want to have all five family, five, yeah. five people work there. but. Uh, but you know, uh, I still work there to help them out at night, right? So, so that is, that's how, uh, I call family values and we have Vietnamese. We came here. We want to take care of each other, at least a starting point. So one year later, we save about $90,000. My oldest brothers wanted to buy apartment, right? Invest into an apartment to rent. And, and I was uh, scratching my head. I said, well, if we invest into that uh, apartment and we get rent, that is a passive income. It will take a long time to recover. It. So I, I, I initiated the idea that we should invest into a second location. We buy our own building. And that was how my dad at the time told me, Andrew, uh, uh, you know, my name is Ang, right? Uh, yeah. In Vietnamese, Ang, legal Ang, actually. And uh, say, Ang, uh, 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 whatever you do, because uh, my dad knew that I, you know, I had uh, education in the Western society. So he told me, uh, say, um, whatever you do, don't leave anyone behind. So that statement from my dad at that time struck me, struck me, right? So I, um, you know, so that's how I grew the company. Sometimes you have the questions here that is that easy to get five brothers to get, you know, to get consensus from uh, the five brothers? It's very difficult. Not only the five brothers and their spouses too. And so, and then later on their children. So, um, so because my dad was saying that, and then I uh, thought, you know, I honor him by, um, you know, doing what he uh, wanted us to do. Okay. There's always one guy that does not follow the program. There's always, there's like, if I, all five of you can't be superheroes and, and great American businessmen, all five of you, I don't know who that one guy is, but it doesn't matter because what I'm about to ask is how do you deal with motivating the bottom person or the two bottom or the three bottom people that are not really performing up to the standards that the top two or three are see it just a big, um, cluster problem in my head when when i read your story i was like i'm so compelled to figure out how five brothers and and here's the bigger implications if five brothers can do it the whole country of vietnam the whole vietnamese global people should take a page book out of your business how do you unite five brothers how do you unite three ming ming bắc ming trung ming nam and I'm just trying to make these parallels. There's mm -hmm. no causation or correlation. I just want to see how did you get everybody on board with the program? Well, Ken, it's uh, so difficult, excruciating difficult. 
uh, to get everyone in consensus. Sometimes we have, you know, if, if you um, ask me, if, I, if I'm telling you that uh, it's easy to get them to agree on certain things, right, then I'm lying to you. So it's literally almost every time we meet, we talk about issues and uh, literally three of my brothers uh, didn't, didn't buy them. Right? So they want they wanted good news more than bad news. And as a person who is leading the charge, lead, you know, moving the company forward, um, then you have to, I had to make sure that uh, um, I maneuver myself to get, to make decisions without consensus, basically. Right? So sometimes we argue, we argue, but I have to make sure that, you know, put the ego aside. Right and take a walk in the parking lot and drink that cup of, uh, you know, cold water and come back five minutes later just to make sure that, you know, hey, you know what, this is what we're going to do. Right? Or if you can do it, let me prove it to you. Right? So over a long time, I had to build trust within the families. I had to reach out to them individually and I have to talk with them individually. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they didn't agree, but one, one thing that I'm lucky is all of my siblings, even though they didn't agree on certain things, they didn't say break up the company. Right. So that is, that is the lucky, you know, I, I was lucky because of that. And, and, and moving the company forward, uh, I uh, work with uh, people I hire from outside mm-hmm. a lot more than what with my uh, siblings. Uh, at, at one time, Ken, uh, our company had seven different retail retail locations, store funds. Yeah. Right? My my uh, ambition ambition at that time was Starbucks with food, right? and each of my brothers managed a store with their wife, um. and the um, the um, wholesale uh, that we deliver to hotels, uh, hospitality industry uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, I manage that, and then I also manage all the finance, uh, manage all the book uh, bookkeepings, all the banking, all the HR, and hiring people from outside. So I did all of that, and and um, they they were happy with you know uh, a store managing with their wife, and um, five o'clock in the morning they uh, they um, came out to uh, open the door, and six o'clock in the afternoon they close the door and they go home. So they, they were happy with that. And then for me, um, it's always um, uh, today we have to do better than yesterday. Yeah. And tomorrow, today, I have to prepare to do better yet tomorrow than today. So that's how I put uh, one foot in front of the others and I always push forward. And that's how we grew from a store fund $300 a day sales. So today we have 650 employees. And we have about three hundred thousand square foot facilities with machineries to make uh, to make the, our um, uh, pages. You know, and that's how this story uh, went from there to here. You know, I want to go from uh, the seven retail to the three hundred. You said three hundred thousand square feet uh, footprint, right? Okay, but before we get to even that development part, I just want to really make a quick uh, turn into a question where. <laughs> Because I always think about the labor costs and the material costs and everything. What stopped you in the recent, you know, last five years, perhaps, to go back to Vietnam, create a complete line of uh, machinery and labor and everything in Vietnam, and then ship containers of finished pastries? I mean, because it still could hold over the ocean, you know, in the shipping line, right? Uh, what, what I mean, is there any plans or any thoughts of not taking the entire production back to Vietnam? Okay, and um, uh, in food and beverage, um, uh, believe me, um, people trust the um, safety of the food and beverage made, made here than made in others, other countries. So many, many of uh, my fans or even myself, if I go to a supermarket and I buy certain things and it's made in China, right, then I hesitate to buy it. Even though I pay another 50 cents more or a dollar more, I would prefer to buy food 
made in America. The um, the uh, list, uh, the uh, regulations uh, for food here is so difficult. Right? So so we are in food. We know that you have to deal with the FDA. You have to deal with um, the um, uh, state health uh, inspectors, and in addition to that, you have to deal with the retailers, um, uh, their own uh, audit. And so we have we, we call SQF level three audits, and that is the top of the food chain. That you that some of the biggest uh, company they don't even have uh, level three; they have level two. Right? SQF that means um, uh, food safety uh, program. Uh, that we have to uh, track everything that we buy. Uh, we have to track every lot that we make. If anything that in that food, food chain, we know exactly where to record. And we know exactly where to take it out. So in Vietnam, it's very difficult. You know, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, if, if you want to, um, educate your workers how to do these things here, and how to get the waters, uh, good water source, or you know something. It's it's a little different, and it, I'm I'm not you know I'm not expert in 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 that part of the world. So maybe people can do it, but I don't. Right, so it's better to do it here. And and most of our retailers are the biggest company in America, like Costco, Walmart, Sam's, Safeway, right, Bonds, you name it. All of them trust the product made in America a lot more than overseas. Okay, that's a great answer. Now, going back to how you got to the big retailers, how did you grow from seven retail comp- uh, retail uh, stores to get into a bigger uh, box, uh, box uh, stores? It's, uh, it took a lot of time for, you know, for us to get, even get our foot into a uh, Costco store. Costco was a retailer that was very tough, but it's very easy. Tough is you have to be big enough to make products for them. And you have to be humble enough, small enough for them to know your story. Right? And when you sell to them and they sell well, then you have to scale up with them. And a small manufacturer like us, it's very difficult. Here, this is how we made it. Uh, back in 1990, uh, when the uh, hotel industry in the Bay Area did not manage their labor well, so they reached out to us to make products for them. So, so that's how I start opening up more store fund and focus into making products for uh, the hotels, the hospitality industry, like. Uh, High tech buildings that you know you have all the uh, coffee shop that the pastry for free for employees. If you remember in the um, in the nineteen uh, nineties or two thousand, a lot of them are free, right? So we, we roll with that kind of um, hype and and we made a lot of products for them. Uh, at one point in time, we have uh, seven hundred and fifty different products, size four thousand skill twenty trucks on the road. Wow. Seven retail locations, and we add more commissaries. We we make this product, that products, and here and there we have five different manufacturers in the Bay Area. Right? But but so, why did why did uh, these hotels and stuff didn't go to other? Because there's so many bakeries and small mom and pop uh, donut shops. Why did they come to you to get this kind of production? Because I I uh, was always out there to sell our story and get connections. So in, in, in business, uh, can, uh, people say, uh, you know, creative, creativity can create business, create trends, but I would say passion create business and create trends. Right? You have to have passion. So I could stay back to, uh, in my, um, you know, my, uh, bakery, uh, make sample, ask people, ask my driver to deliver to the chef in the hotels. And then I wrote a personal note, say, mm-hmm. chef. I love you to uh, try our, um, you know, our dentist, our croissants, and our donut, uh, our our uh, cake, and that's how I create um, relationship with mm-hmm. all these chefs. Right? So at that time, we 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 became so big 
uh, it's so big, but the economy collapsed. It, if you remember 2008, it, it, economy collapsed. But before that, I was want to diversify our our customer base before that. I uh, knocked on a Costco store, Safeway store, and I kept I kept uh, getting re- rejected from time to time right, because we were small. And uh, 2002, about 2000, 2002, uh, there was uh, a group of uh, Costco buyers in the Bay Area. They took a tour in our manufacturing and they pointed to one product that we make. We call Parmes. The Parmes that you buy from Costco, seven ninety nine for that big pack. Um, and they say, can you make that in high quality for us? So, you know what? That was um, a surprise to me that they asked us to make. So I asked my worker to put into 800 some layers and make all burdens. And we sold it for only 599 a pack. Right? So at that time, it took off with Costco. And that product is still there, right? Still there. If you go to Costco, you buy the products. Now it's uh, two pounds uh, for seven nine nine or brothers two thousand five hundred and ninety two layers that we you know improve the products over time. So that's how quality keep that door open for us. People say marketing can open the door, regardless how. Uh, charismatic you are or you know how um, how much you reach out to your customers at the end of the day it's your the quality of your products and your people and your the reputation of your company would keep the door open for you right? so that's how we do and we that's how we get into Costco and later on we get into uh, Safeway and back to uh, 2008 the economy collapsed so we decided, I decided to, to tell my siblings that, you know what, it's not worth it to manage three business models. One, store funds, two, food service, and now we, we have retails, right? So we decided to sell all of our store funds, sell all, uh, sell all our uh, food service, um, and then we cut the companies in half. And we move only three products out of 750. Right to Hayward, we bought two buildings in Hayward, and then we get machine and we scale it up. So, so from seven hundred and fifty different products, twenty drivers on the road to only three products and no driver. Wow! And that's how we scale it up. So basically, we we in the past we do we did more for less, and then after that we decided to scale it to 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 um. Uh, to cut the companies in half, uh, we scale it up. We do a lot less for more. I used to work twenty four seven. I uh, can I I didn't take the vacations or I did not uh, you know uh, go um, uh, anywhere uh, with my wife uh, a lot more than nowadays because uh, nowadays you know uh, the machine makes the products and um, uh, the team you know they they know how to um, structure it so it's a lot easier to have uh, retailers. To bring their truck and ship fit uh, um, uh, 50 three footers, right? So it's, it's a long truck to come to our facility and ship the whole truck itself. You know, you pack one, two, three, you know, in a box and we ship to the hotels. So, so, so it was a difficult decision to make, but at some time it was a great decision. Do you think any of this had to do with the way you were raised? with the, your mom and dad, were they merchants or business people? Uh, and are you, part, do you have Chinese culture, ethnicity uh, if in your family? Yeah, uh, my, uh, my dad um, um, immigrated from uh, China to, uh, to Vietnam and he had a family, he had family there. So he married my mom, my mom, uh, you know, uh, is Chinese, but um, uh, was born in Vietnam. Um, uh, to answer your questions, uh, no, really, uh, my uh, my parents were peasants, right? So they they were farmers. Uh, but I read a lot of books when when I was uh, going to school uh, about fifth grade, sixth grade. I didn't finish sixth grade, by the way, but I I read a lot of books. My my dad loved to buy newspaper and book for me to read, and I credit my dad my education to my dad. I um, uh, you know he's he. His love to me, 
to buy book, newspaper, and covid me to read. I read a lot of books. And uh, when I came to America, I, re- I continued to read books. I read uh, uh, Walmart, you know, uh, Sam Walton's mm-hmm. uh, biography. Uh, I read um, uh, uh, Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins. I read um, View to Last uh, by Jim Collins. I read um, Blue Ocean Strategies by the two professors in the, at Hayward. So these books are fascinating. Uh, teach you how to uh, make your you, you don't have to compete with your competitors, but sometimes you you, you it, it taught you how to uh, make your comp- competition uh, crazy. Right? So and then you have to do, um, you know you have how how do you build a company uh, toward a uh, hundred years from now? It's not like you build a company and then later on you sell it. Or you build a company and you attract uh, a PE or uh, public uh, investment, outside investment, and then you have to always look at the numbers. Right? So, so I I was fascinated by uh, 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 Sam Walton, how he started a company from a corner store and build it up, and he hired talent to run it, and he. He create all the trust for his children, right? And then now you look at all his children are the richest people on earth. Yep. They don't work at Walmart. They are on the board, right? So that is a typical example why I say sometimes our philosophy, the, the Eastern philosophy, that when you have a company, your children have to, you know, um, run it uh, after you don't run it, right? So I, I say, wait a minute, it's Harlan runs business, not because of who that mm-hmm. person is. Right? Let's say Sam Walton, if he allow his children to run the company, maybe they screw it up. Yeah, for sure. They benefit no one, yep. right? So now the company is the biggest on earth. And they don't, the, the, uh, the Walton family don't run it. They don't have to work. Right. And Costco, the same thing. The founder founded the company. They started it right in back in 1983 with one store. And people said it was a crazy idea that you know you have to collect the membership for people to shop here. But they started it and then they expanded, right? And now the co the two founders' children don't run it, but they are the richest people on earth too. So, so that's, that's a typical example. I say talent runs business. And uh, along the way here, you have a question, uh, uh, the second generation successions. Yep. I say successions. Well, in every department that I, uh, I have in the company, every department has to have success, right? Bad thing can happen to good people. If you have a CFO, right? And he has no success in that C, uh, that finance role, and he is run by the birds, and he passed away. Who's going to run the, uh, the the finance department? So my requirement for my my team is you have to create successes. And for me, I create successes. I I my uh, nephews right, along the way, uh, and some of them are great. All of them are good at what they do, right? But some of them can do well at what they do, but they cannot be commander. Right? Wow. If you if you are a commander in chief, you have to make tough decisions. You have to have a tough conversations. You have to set, tell people, you have to pat on people's back and say, quit job. And if they don't do a good job, you have to say, hey, you know what? You have to make change. So these things are, I am looking at for, at, you know, at the successor, my successors. And believe me or not, Ken, I, uh, I, I look at well, this successor for 15 years. And I work with one of my nephews. He's great. He's brilliant UCLA graduate. Right? He can be, you know, working very hard. But the only one thing that he cannot make a decisive decision. Right? You have to make a very decisive decision but can in that, order to... Can that be taught? Difficult personality sometimes. It's sometimes uh, you have uh, passive ego. We call it passive ego. Right? Mm-hmm. Passive ego, that means you don't agree, but you don't say it. 
right? And then at the end of the day, it's too late. Then you have to make a decision. You know, it affects people. It's very difficult to, you know, sometimes uh, uh, when I mentor people, uh, it's not because I'm great in, in mentoring people, right? It has to be a great mentee who wants to learn it, yeah. right? Between you and I, we talk. I learn a lot from you, Ken. I learn a lot from by by looking at you, by looking at uh, looking at your manners, by looking at your questions. I learn a lot, from you. and and that's how that's who I am. I come out and I talk to people. I learn a lot from people. So, how do you sort of think about the real role of education? Because it sounds like. Uh, the business sense that you have come from reading, comes from real world leading. And I don't know what kind of education your other brothers and siblings have, but it doesn't sound like, to me, education really plays a big role in the development of something really big, right? You have to have vision. You have to have this tenacity. You have to have a good head, uh, common sense on your, 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 your head. Uh, but I'm sure there's nephews and nieces in your world that went on to get good education and are smart and diligent, but they don't have certain specific traits you need to build and run the Walmarts of the world. So I am always searching for that, you know, that answer about like our people, our Vietnamese culture, we always put such a heavy, heavy emphasis on education, but is that the answer anymore? Well, I think uh, to answer, answer your question, my uh, siblings uh, did not have uh, great education. They, uh, they, they, they don't even speak English well. I, um, I do speak English a little. You know, I, I would say it's, uh, it's uh, okay, right? So, uh, so um, education play a major role in a person's development. But if that person continues to have uh, education called continuous education. After you get graduated from school, after you uh, be a doctor, after you uh, be a CPA, or it's continuous education, right? And and continuous improvement for all of us is so crucial in today's changing world. The world is changing so fast. Right? You, the law is, you know, is coming out every day, you know, uh, uh, or even every minute, right? And, and um, the people are changing their behavior every day. You have to change with the world. And, and uh, to, be in a, to be a CEO, yeah, I, we are talking about success in here, right? So uh, to be a CEO is uniquely different. Uh, it's not like, okay, I, um, you know, uh, I, I graduated from UCLA, I can be a high tech uh, person, I can be a CPA, I can be a, a doctor, but a CEO is, is a people's person, right? And you have to have that um, skill set to make sure that you work with people well, right? So, and that you have to have a skill set to go out there, own some key relationship. You have to have a skill set to know your vision and to own it. And you have to have a skill set to know the numbers, what you want, how you want it. Does it affect any uh, uh, any people, any people, any other um, uh, members that work in the companies when you make a decision? So all these here is a uniquely belong to a CEO. Right. It's not like you know a doctor or you know a, a engineer. My my son is a doctor. Right? My second son is a um, uh, is a uh, packaging engineer. People always ask me, Andrew. So no, your 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 children don't run the company anymore. I say, if they happen to be that person, I love to have them run. If they don't happen to that person, then I would rather to have someone else to run it, to benefit them. So 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 that is my philosophy, and I always I always can I always give uh, uh, an example of uh, Sam Walton, uh, their their, their ch his children right became uh, the richest people on earth. They don't work there, 
Ang Wang, remember Ang Wang la Ang Wang Laboratory uh, in the 80s. Ang Wang, the uh, software hardware company in Boston, Massachusetts. Yes. Yeah. So Dr. Wang, Dr. Wang, we were a company, very successful, very well known. And uh, he always wanted his son to be uh, the president. And his son was not capable, but he installed his son to be the president. And he had investors. And when, when the investors, um, um, when the company didn't do well, then what do you think the investor would do, right? Investor uh, pressure him to make sure he had, make, to have, he had to make a decision. So he ended up firing his son. And, and when he got older, and uh, at the time that he was uh, in the hosp hospital bed, he had to mend his relationship with his son. Wow. And again, you know, now, now we no longer see Wang Laboratory anymore, anywhere. Yeah. Right? So, so, so in, in the world of business, always a uh, talent runs the company. You have to structure the company correctly, right? To last, to be an ongoing concern, or to last a hundred or two hundred years, like Ford, like uh, you know Chrysler, like Microsoft, and you have to have talent run them. Otherwise, it's eventually it's gonna be you know screw up. Yeah. Now, in the beginning, when you started with your brothers, did you have your kind of your dreams of growing something really big? Or were you just kind of going along every day and just doing the best that you could? And every now and then you would have this epiphany and you would uh, blow up the company a little bit hurt, bigger. You know, I mean, people like, I feel like people uh, can either have this mindset of saying, you know, I'm going to go for that big thing, or they could just be like, I'm going to work hard every day. And who cares what the outcome is because I'm enjoying my work every day. What camp do you fall into? I, um, I follow the, uh, I, I, I enjoy my work every day, right? I, um, we didn't have a, a formal structure. The company structured correctly, right? Because I reach out to people and reach out to lawyers and I, I, I structure the companies correctly. Right? The corporations own Sugar Bowl Bakery. The LLC own the real estate, right? So along the way, we go, we, we, you know, we, open up our um, retail shop or uh, open up our manufacturing, we buy those three states. And then the, the uh, corporation ran that way. So the company structured correctly. But when we work to, you know, to, I didn't have any ambitions that, you know, one day I become a one, two hundred million dollars company. I did not. I know that hard work never kill anyone. So <laughs> I want to work hard. And I knew that in order for us to work hard, we have to make money. A company has to make money to treat people well. Right? So regardless how much we make or how little we make, we want to make money. Right? So anything that did not do well, we get rid of it. Anything that does well, we try to improve that to be even better. Anything that is broken, we have to fix it. Okay, so that is my my philosophy, and and so so um, that's how I work. And then uh, that's how I I but I set goals though. I said every year I want to buy a real estate in, in the early time, buy one real estate for the companies, or buy re one real estate for myself or my siblings. So that's every year the first ten or fifteen years we did that. And then, and then I, um, I always um, told people, uh, we don't look at the numbers that much. The number, yeah, we, we have to look at it, but we don't focus on that much. We know that the direction is the more, mm -hmm. most important than the number that we have to look at every, every, uh, every day. So, so direction is the most important thing for me. As of today, I still advise my CEO. I just hired the CEO to take over my, my role uh, so I can spend more time with my wife uh, because I'm getting older, Ken. Uh, so so, so uh, I always tell him, you know what? As long as we make money, I don't care how much we make, how little we make, the direction of the company is the most important thing than you know, uh, the number per se. 
What what were some of the pivotal lucky moments in your career? The lucky moment in my career is uh, when I, uh, you know, uh, uh, decided to um, uh, to uh, support Costco uh, for their uh, 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 for their philanthropy, right? So they um, they raise money for, to support um, uh, the children of the Miracle Network and and uh, scholarship for uh, people of color, right? And I uh, I decided to sign up. At that time, the company was so small. I signed up. It's a big chunk of money. I signed up. I went to a Costco's, um, you know, CEO's house privately with about another maybe 150 other people. And all of them are, believe me, uh, Ken, uh, this is 25 years ago. All of them are white. Right? Only me and my, my niece were Asian. They welcomed us with open arms. And they reach out to us and they build that relationship with us. The second year, they have some Asians coming to their house, some black people, and they are the most, they are the most down to earth people. And they, you know, people often say, uh, big companies, they have no heart. No, I don't believe so. I think big companies, the people on the top of the big companies, they are down to earth. They have heart. They love to diversify their, you know, their, uh, the network, the people. So um, uh, that was uh, one of the luckiest uh, moments for me. And that, that we built a great re- relationship. And later on, um, Safeway CEO Steve Worth uh, throw a, um, an event at his home. I show up, you know, Ken, I didn't, I didn't speak English well at the time, but I show up. So I show up in many, many events. And the first time, Ken, the, the first time people don't, don't, don't know you and don't, they, they may not care about you. Right? Second time they see you and they say hello to you. The third time they see you again, they may want to take your business card. The fourth time they will say, hey, you know what, call me. So that is how I, th- I think my persistency create, you know, the uh, opportunity for the companies to go forward. And that's how I, I did it. And, and those are things I can, I can call those are the luckiest moment for myself too, because if without those opportunities, right, I didn't have these these chances to um, you know to build a company and to move the company forward. Yeah, because I I feel like there's so much uh, that happens in a business, and many businesses don't get to scale or get to the sizes that uh, that you have and other massive businesses. And it seems like there's these lucky moments that are happening to a business or to a founder that takes them to the next level. And really all of this stuff is lucky. I mean, you, you work hard and you prepare and you, you make sure that when you get the lucky chance to present yourself on stage, that you're ready to go. But it never seems like people operate in a vacuum or like, it's just, you know, it's, there's a lot of luck that's involved in everybody's career success. Yeah. You know what uh, I would say, uh, Luck is a dividend of hard work, right? So you have to work hard to create luck. Um, a person can, you know, sit there and wait for luck to come just by a lottery ticket, right? Yeah. But I, I would say I can't um, um, uh, work hard first and create opportunity for yourself. Um, I, um, I, always, uh, I often um, mentor people. They ask me um, what, what should they do uh, first. I say, you know what, tell your story. You have to tell your story. You have to create a so- compelling story to tell. Everyone has a story to tell. I told my story straightforward, right? I'm Vietnamese. I was a boat person. I came here without money. I um, I did not speak English well. I did not born in a uh, uh, wealthy family. I came here. I work hard, and I create opportunity. And I treat people right, uh, correctly. Well, I always tell people you can take down the king, but do not pick on the janitor. Right? So, so I create those stories and I allow people to see it. And, and if you tell me that, um, uh, I go out there and people say, uh, are you a Chinese? Are you uh, from where? No, I'm Vietnamese. I, you know, I always tell people straightforward. I am, I am who I am. I don't want to be anybody else. And, yeah, you know, uh, so so people love to see a real me. 
not a me that I pretend to be. Right? So, so the other day I went to uh, uh, pick up a, a prescription, and the gentleman clearly he he was a Vietnamese, and he called me uh, Mr. Lai. I say, okay, are you Vietnamese? And then he say, yeah, I'm Vietnamese. Now, L-Y, is that Lee or uh, Lai? He say, oh, uh, Lee. I say, you know, I say I'm Vietnamese, so just call me Lee. You know, I correct people the way, you know, politely. It's not like, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to be impolite to people, but I want to leave. I want to die original. I don't want to leave a copy. So mm. that is that is who, who I am. And people love, uh, love me for who I am. Not everyone will love me, but majority of those people from above me, you know, from my customer, my vendors, uh, the White House, the Congress, people who, uh, you know, who know me, they know I am who I am. And I tell people a real story. I don't want to create another, you know, uh, uh, false story for people to, to impress people. Absolutely no. I tell my, my um, if you go to my social media, you see it. I absolutely want to be me, and 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 that is me, and and I'm 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 always Vietnamese, even though my my father is a Chinese, but I still a Vietnamese because I was born in Vietnam. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that because uh, you know I, my great grandfather is uh, from China, uh, and you know on my mom's side it's all Vietnamese, but on my father's side you know they're married Chinese, and you know they're from uh, South Chang, Cần Thơ. A lot of uh, Ming Tai, you know, there's a lot of uh, Chinese. But when I talk about this issue and I think about it, like Ki Hui Kwan, which is an actor who just won the Oscar, uh, you know, there's a lot of like pushback in Vietnam saying, well, that guy's Chinese. But, you know, just like you and me uh, have roots in Vietnam and we were, you know, my father was born in Vietnam and, you know, ethnically it's it, it could go so many ways, but it's it's no different than like a Mexican person, second generation being born in America, and him saying, "Well, I'm an American," and so that always really warms my heart when we, you know, even though at or by blood you're you're 100 Chinese or I'm let's say 25 Chinese or whatever, we can still claim Vietnam. I mean, have you ever thought about this this idea that? We claim Vietnamese as our heritage, even though we have Chinese blood. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm proud to uh, claim Vietnamese as my heritage, right? And if people say ethnicity, you know, uh, so your your great uh, grandparents, I say, yeah, they were from China, but I was born in Vietnam. Um, there, there, there were some disputes about, um, you know, one of one of the relatives always wanted to say. Oh, you are Chinese. You are no, no Vietnamese. I say why? You know, my passport say I'm I'm from Vietnam. That's indisputable. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm from Vietnam. So why why do I have to pretend? You know, uh, I'm Chinese because I was not born in China, right? So let's 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 set the record straight. I was from, you know, I was born in Vietnam. I'm Vietnamese. If you ask me, my parents, yes, they are Chinese, right? and and. You know what? We can be proud of uh, Vietnamese too, right? Vietnamese uh, is no different from China uh, because they, you know, they they are Asians, right? Uh, even though the language is different, um, um, you know, the um, uh, the food or anything else is very similar. And and why why do we have to be uh, uh, Chinese or Vietnamese? Now in China, they have thirty five different um, ethnicities, right? Mm -hmm. My my father is Chiu Chao, right? So my wife's family is Cantonese. So they are different. And sometimes the people say, oh, you know what? Uh, the Cantonese is, you know, uh, above the Chiu Chao or the Chiu Chao above the Chinese. It doesn't make sense, right? A Chinese is Chinese. And, and remember uh, a lot of uh, time when we uh, Ken, this is a, a story I think uh, I have to share here. When we came here 30 some 40 years ago, people spit on us, and those are not white people. Right? Because people came here so long, and they think, oh, we came, we, 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 we were both people, 
we came here because we poor. We are the latest to come here as, um, um, as the, you know, we're refugees or immig immigrants, and we are we were lower than them. Our status lower than them, right? So that perception divided us, and I don't want that perception to carry on. I would say, a Vietnamese, Vietnamese. We, I am a boat person. I am Vietnamese, and I'm proud to be Vietnamese, and I'm proud to 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 see the Vietnamese people all over the world now is making improvements, right? And and if you go back, I went back to Vietnam in 2018. I saw Vietnam improve a lot, right? Over 40 some years, and the, yes, there may, there may be a lot more to improve, but I'm. I am extremely um, happy to see that. And I just went to um, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia. I took a three country, cross country tour. I saw a lot of Vietnamese shops, right? Uh, either Long Phong in, uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, Little Saigon, or a big bun mi shop in the Malaysia, or a, 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 a young lady who uh, we're uh, proudly with the Vietnamese written in the back, uh, walking on the street, and, uh, uh, or, you know, a, a, a mega, you know, a, um, a big uh, green uh, uh, shop in, the, in a mega mall in uh, Thailand. So the Vietnamese people now is, is living in a lot of different countries, and many of us are successful, right? And many of us have that, family value, right? and uh, a sense of communities, right? and a sense of co cohesiveness. Right? See, you see, Santa Ana, so many Vietnamese live there, right? They have a community there. San Jose, Houston, right? um, Alabama, right? So, so, so I'm proud to be, be Vietnamese. A lot of Vietnamese high, live, uh, work in high tech, uh, very famous in, you know, uh, healthcare, incredible in podcast um and and all of us you know i'm i'm in food right uh, low tech but you know we can be successful in the field that we put our heart to work and the vietnamese people are very good at that right? every time i have a person of uh, a bit older than me say what you just said it makes me think about the struggle that happened 48 years ago, almost 50 years ago, that we left the country, our motherland. But we look back and things are great. We have resilience and we've done so much good on earth. I mean, whether it's in arts or commerce or business, we as a community who have left the country have done a lot of good. And I go back to this question, this debate that some people in the much older generation, a bit older than you, hold on to the pain and the suffering of losing. And I want to discuss that a little bit because, you know, we just went uh, past uh, April 30th recently. And, you know, this idea of holding on so tightly to the past, it destroys our, our it's very destructive in our community. How do we move past this? idea of loss and, and pain and suffering. When you look back, we've done great. We've almost 50 years across the world and we've built massive businesses and we've made major strides and success in the medical field, politics, podcasts, music, arts, what you name it. We are in 48 years, we are in many top positions that we, and a lot could be done more, but I look at it with gratitude and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what you think about how the older generation or some even younger than me have this have held on to this idea that we we lost but i think we've gained so much yeah yeah i think uh, you uh, said it right that resiliency you know uh, the vietnamese people have uh, gone through a lot and and um uh, i think i think those uh, older generations and and people still hold the grudge in, inside them i think they have to let go right um uh some people say we lost a country. No, we didn't lose a country, right? The country is still managed by Vietnamese. Yeah. Right? The Vietnamese people still uh, live there. 
uh, the government's Vietnamese, even a different form of government. Uh, we like it or we don't, right? Some Republicans don't like Democrats, don't, some Democrats don't like Republicans. Same thing here. It's just like something there, right? You know, if, uh, yeah, you, uh, we, uh, the philosophy at the time, true philosophy, true right, right? Uh, the Vietnamese people, basically those older generations, uh, they still ha- hold on to those, uh, you know, uh, angers and, uh, uh, you know, bitterness, right? Um, they believe in one philosophy. Uh, the other side believe in the other philosophy. Two of them, uh, you know, they they were right. Uh, the the biggest the the biggest conflict in Vietnamese uh, in the Vietnam War is because two right couldn't solve the problems, couldn't get to solve to the consensus. That's why it was you know it, uh, that 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 created the uh, the war and and uh, one side one over the others. It doesn't mean that you lose the country. You don't lose the country. The country has been just like you said has been making progress. And it's amazing to see Ho Chi Minh City, or you call it Saigon, right? whatever you want to call it. They don't, they don't mind right now, right? You know, the Communist Party don't mind. Um, and, and you look at high rises, you look at, you know, uh, you look at the progress they have made. You look at the young people, they go to bar, they dance, they, you know, love music, but they love high tech. People, those young people don't even know that there was a war. They don't exactly. even know what it was about. Yeah, exactly. Million people in Vietnam, I mean, 60 million of them don't even have a clue of what we uh, as second generation, I'm a second generation, 47 year old Vietnamese man. They don't even understand that there's this weird packaging that I think about when I think about my parents fleeing. And it's part of our history in America. But it's like I, I just don't understand why we have to keep carrying this load. It's heavy and we not, we need to get rid of it. And yeah, I think I think education. I think uh, you know a lot of education, a lot of uh, uh, the young people, um, or you know, uh, if if those people have uh, families members that younger, uh, they can educate their you know uh, the elders. Say you know what uh, these are the past. You know, let it go. Let's move forward the future. Let's build Vietnam to a you know to a different you know different um, uh, society. So uh, to a greater society. And you know, you look at Vietnam now; it's uh, becoming a probably economic power, right? So yeah, uh, look, the uh, Southeast Asia, you know, um, um, uh, Vietnam has a, a great standing, right? Uh, you go to Costco nowadays; you go, you know, you flip uh, the <laughs> shirt over made in Vietnam. You know, right? You go to Best Buy; you uh, pick up that uh, you know small box of uh, anything that you know. Uh, in high tech made in Vietnam, and the Vietnamese people are you know smart, right? They they love peace, right? They don't want they don't want war. Uh, they love to enjoy life. They love uh, entrepreneurship, and they love you know they even though they they it's a it's a, a one party um, a vertical vertical government, right? But they allow people to have entrepreneurship. And and I look at uh, Vietnam; it's uh, growing. You know, it's like uh, uh, China growing uh, twenty years, twenty five yep. years ago. Right? It's a beautiful thing to see. Now, yeah. as you are winding down your role of CEO and handing over the reins and everything like that, what what interests you now for the rest of your time on Earth? What do you want to see with the time that you spend? What what are you interested in? Well, I uh, I am interested in um, you know travel along the um, around the world with my uh, my wife uh, of thirty four years. Uh, she sacrificed a lot for me. Mm-hmm. At the time, uh, I uh, I was managing the companies. Uh, you know, had to play a man, one man. You know, um, uh, one man um, uh, operations. Even though I have uh, siblings and I have employees, but I'm uh, at the center of everything. Right? So. Uh, she didn't travel anywhere much, wow. and and so I, uh, I I like to make sure that you know I take care of her, uh, and uh, I still have to involve in the business a little bit here and there. I just want to make sure that I I keep the culture of the company uh, uh, the way it is or better, uh, treat people right, uh, make sure that you know we uh, build great products, make sure that we uh, we uh, do not forget our community if we have a chance to. Uh, 
uh, support them. Uh, I love to go to um, certain uh, community events to make sure that uh, represent the family's uh, uh, name to uh, support them to uh, you know to to still have the legacy there. Right? So so those things are that, that I, I love to do, and I love to uh, enjoy uh, fine wine with uh, certain friends. Uh, I love to sit down and uh, learn from people. Uh, continuous learning for me is uh, forever. You know, uh, even though I uh, I'm getting older, but I don't think that I should I should stop learning anytime. Right? Learning for me is uh, the greatest thing. You know, uh, I enjoy. In the, every morning, I can um, just the last two days. I uh, I uh, you know I get into your podcast. I mm-hmm. listen to a couple of them. Uh, great, you know, great people have a uh, great diverse uh, viewpoint of the world. You know, uh, how to you know how to define Vietnamese and uh, uh, what they want and uh, their contribution to the society. All of those things are something that I I love to learn. You know, uh, the reason I ask people like you to come on to the podcast is because we walk into. A Costco. We walk into a Safeway. We walk into all these big places, and there are signs of Vietnamese touching the big, big companies. Sugar bowl is everywhere, but people don't realize that. And that's the beauty of, for me, my journey. The beauty is to be able to talk to somebody who's been at this for a long time. You are in our lives everywhere we turn because I'm at Costco twice a week. I'm at all these box stores. I'm at all these places, uh, as well as uh, many of my contemporary Vietnamese of my age are shopping at these places for their families. And you've touched all of our lives, and we don't even realize it. We don't even understand the significance yet. And I thank you so much for agreeing to come onto the podcast so you can share your journey and share the wisdom that you've picked up and accumulated all these years. Andrew, thank you so much. And I hope to one day meet you in person and you inspire me. And I'm sure people listening to this will be inspired as well. Well, thank you, Ken. Thank you for doing a great job. And uh, I think uh, your podcast uh, has a lot of uh, value in uh, educate, educating our, uh, you know, our, the members of our Vietnamese communities. And uh, a great thing about your podcast is uh, to get all of the diverse Vietnamese uh, together in Either that's uh, in Vietnam or you know in uh, any anywhere in the world or in the U.S. And um, uh, thank you for your kind words as well. Thank you, Andrew. We'll talk okay. soon. Okay. Okay. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Vietnamese with Kenneth Win. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Win, Catherine Win, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at the Vietnamese Podcast.